Hello and welcome to The Scramble. Today we discuss fake news in the Trump era and how it affects the American people's view of the media. Lastly, we'll talk about the rise of political activism in our country and the Las Vegas, Ve Las Vegas community. I'm Sarah Coker and this is The Scramble. Now, I'm sure I don't have to explain what fake news is, but it is important to discuss how it affects the political news climate. The phrase fake news, popularized by President Trump himself, has been used to describe biased or sensationalized stories, or coverage that Trump wasn't too fond to hear about. Trump, however, isn't the only one who sees fake news as a problem. The Washington Post's Bob Woodward says that some reporters become emotionally unhinged when covering the president and are quick to sound like they're personally ridiculing him. Former host of The Scramble Tommy Lahren has also commented on this type of biased reporting, saying facts don't care about your feelings. Despite the president's sometimes harsh opinions of the media, applications to colleges to become journalism majors have increased. Reports from the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism has reported a 19% increase in journalism application. Subscriptions to the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal have also gone up. This increase in news consumption has created a noticeable dis difference in political activism. On our last episode of The Scramble, we talked about the Parkland shooting and what the students of Parkland plan to do. On March 14th, we saw thousands of students nationwide participate in a walkout for 17 minutes to represent each of the 17 students killed in the shooting. School districts' reactions varied from school placing obstacles, such as trucks in front of the school premises, to locked gates like Diablo High School in Concord, California, as well as some school districts in, in support of the protest. We've also seen celebrity examples of political activism, such as professional basketball player LeBron James and actress Jennifer Lawrence saying she's going to take a break from acting to focus on political activism. Do celebrities influence the younger generation to be more politically aware? Is the current political climate we're in and social media affecting it? And how does the popular phrase fake news change how we view media? We'll discuss all this in our panel. Now, I'm sure I don't have to explain what fake news is, but it is important to, to discuss how it affects the political news climate. The phrase fake news, popularized by President Donald Trump himself, has been used to describe biased or sensationalized stories, or coverage that Trump wasn't too fond to hear about. Trump, however, isn't the only one who sees fake news as a problem. The Washington Post's Bob Woodward says that some reporters become emotionally unhinged when covering the president and are quick to sound like they're personally ridiculing him. Former host of The Scramble, Tommy Lahren, has also commented on this type of biased reporting, reporting saying facts don't care about your feelings. Despite the president's sometimes harsh opinion on the media, applications to colleges to become journalism majors have increased. Reports from the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism has reported a 19% increase in journalism applications. Subscriptions to the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal have also gone up. This increase in news consumption has created a noticeable increase in political activism. On our last episode of The Scramble, we talked about the Parkland shooting and what the students of Parkland plan to do. On March 14th, we saw thousands of students nationwide participate in a walkout for 17 minutes, each minute to represent the 17 students killed in the shooting. School district reactions vary from schools placing obstacles, such as trucks in front of the school premises, to locked gates like Diablo High School in Concord, California, as well as some schools in support of the protest. We have also seen celebrity examples of political activism, such as professional player LeBron James, and actress Jennifer Lawrence saying she's going to take a break from acting to focus on political activism. Do these celebrities influence younger generations to be more politically aware? Is the current political climate we're in and social media affecting it? And how does the popular phrase fake news change how we view media? We will discuss all this in our panel. For our first panel, we are joined by freelance journalist Colton Scholl and junior political science major Don Donald Wilkinson. Thank you guys for joining us. 
Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. I'm going to start with you. Um, has fake news become popularized under Trump's presidency, or has this something that we've always noticed with former presidents like Richard Nixon and him saying that the press is evil and press is the enemy? Uh, I personally think that it's something that we've always been aware of, but it's definitely been popularized uh, once Donald Trump was elected, um, mainly just because of how much that he likes to make his claims about how this is fake or that's not accurate, um, things along those lines. Um, so. And Colton, do you think that this is something that we've seen or is Donald Trump really put fake news in the spotlight? Uh, I believe that it is absolutely something we've seen. Uh, as you had previously stated with Reagan and my personal favorite president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, literally calling the press muckrakers. Uh, people have always hated the news because the news reports things and, well, sometimes when you report the truth, a lot of people get very angry because the truth is something that they're trying to hide. Uh, and other times uh, you get people who are incredibly biased because they want what they want to be publicized instead of something that is accurate but paints them in a bad light to be publicized. And what happens, you mentioned reporting the truth, sometimes isn't always favorable. What, what happens when we have a government or a president that's not fond of the media? Well, uh, we have Twitter battles is what we have. And um, it, it just ends up being a, a lot of people yelling at each other and the more upset that people get at each other, the crazier it gets, the less professional it gets, and then that's when nothing gets done because the government is too focused on getting back at the media and the media then becomes too focused on getting back at the government and it descends into a word that I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> Donald, uh, what do you think the consequences of having a president who's not fond of the media are? Um, I guess it really does depend on which president we're looking at. Now, if we're looking at someone uh, that in the past, other than Donald Trump, uh, Usually they have a tendency to handle it in a more mature manner uh, where they don't have to necessarily do like the Twitter wars that Colton had mentioned uh, where they publicly post something saying, wow, this is not okay, that I am not approving of this message or things along those lines. Uh, but it's something that we've noticed along uh, definitely when we have Donald Trump uh, in office now because of his constant posts on Twitter, things along those lines. Um, it's definitely... Uh, more of a childish game it turned into when it, uh, now that we have it being more publicized on social media rather than things being handled in a more uh, professional manner and not like off of social media rather like per in person on paper things like that. So, so do you believe that the general public is really following in the footsteps of the president being very quick to distrust the media call it fake and totally disregard any any facts that they don't want to hear? Um, well, it's actually been a known fact for a lot, for a while now, rather than just like Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of people, when it comes to public opinion, um, they tend to gravitate towards things that they already know and they tend to stray away from things that they don't like or don't agree with. So if they see a post on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or whatever you decide to use for your social media, and they don't agree with it, they're probably going to put something in the comments saying this is wrong, this is not, not true, I don't agree with this, this is not okay, things along those lines. And if it's something that they agree with, they probably are going to share it millions of times, say that this is totally accurate, this is exactly what I've been talking about for I don't know how long. Um, there probably has been an increase uh, now that Donald Trump has been president, but it's been a thing that's been going around for quite some time now. Colton, I'm going to pose the same question I did uh, to Donald. Are people surrounding themselves uh, too much with news that kind of fixates to their, their own ideology? Absolutely. Exactly like Daniel was saying, people always want to agree with themselves. Uh, you saw it back forever ago before social media where somebody would say that the earth was round instead of flat and they would burn them to a stake because it's not what they wanted to hear. And now we have these clicks and groups of people in social media creating political cartoons to make each other laugh and they just spread it around in circles digging themselves deeper and deeper and further away from each other which creates a sort of gap where we almost demonize our friends and family because they have different political views than us and that prevents us from coming to a legitimate solution because we are so focused on the fact of oh this happened well time to 
run up social media and make fun of the liberals again. Oh, this happened. Guess what's going to happen when the conservatives hear about this? It's a lot of self-absorption and the needing to feel like you're in a group where people agree with you rather than solving the problem in and of itself. I think we talk a lot about consumers and how they feel about a lot of social issues, but what about the reporters themselves? I, I know you're a freelance journalist. Do you think that sometimes, often in the media, um, reporters can put a little too much emotion and get too, uh, basically all I can say is emotional about some of the topics they cover? Absolutely. If uh, One thing is when you're in uh, the seat where you're providing information to people, you feel a need to get information out about that and that's why I personally started trying to figure stuff out and spread it around was because I wanted to tell people something but I needed a platform to do that with. Uh, that's where I started trying to uh, get into broadcast journalism and video production was so that I could tell people about what was going on and when you have very strong feelings about something then you want to tell people about it and sometimes when you have those strong feelings they leak into what you're reporting and it skews what you're trying to say instead of saying just flat out what it is. So we've talked about the um, consumer's mindset. Um, we talked about it from a journalistic standpoint. But Donald, you're a political science major, um, so you're in a, a lot of classes that have people who aspire to be politicians. Now, I'm not too sure if you want to, um, but how do you think politicians are viewing the media now? Um, politicians are actually probably taking the same route that uh, Donald Trump is not necessarily handling it in the same manner. Uh, a lot of them are probably saying that they don't agree with this because we actually do have more of like a Republican administration at the moment. Um, a lot of and the media is currently like more or less against Republicans, uh, not necessarily saying that they are in the wrong, but because of the president being Republican and they're painting him in a bad light, it more or less translates to the media having a negative view of the like Republican Party. And because of that, uh, everyone is just more or less taking a negative stance towards media, although I'm not 100% sure if we should say that all media is painting in a negative light because there is some where they address it in more of a less biased standpoint, more neutral. They're delivering the news in the proper way, which is what every news co company should be doing. But anything that takes more of a bias, I feel like should be more considered a blog rather than news. So it's not necessarily actually news. It, it could, it's basically fake news. It's just a blog. So you mentioned that um, blogs versus actual news and being able to differentiate the two. Um, a lot of companies are actually trying to put money into where they can filter it to where more credible news sources come up first. I know Google and Facebook are two companies that come to mind. Um, is there methods you think that they can utilize to make sure that credible, unbiased reporting, as you said, comes up first rather than blogs and opinions? Honestly, I'm not really sure if there's a specific route they can take because in the end they're trying to make money and they're going to put the ads that are most relevant, mo the news that's most relevant, things that you like, that you are geared to interpreting, that you um, always seek out. So like if you go on Facebook and you're going down your news feed, you'll see things that like, oh, I just saw a post on that yesterday and I liked it. So it's not necessarily that they're actually putting that effort to make things more relevant and actually facts. It's just them putting things out there that are relevant to their consumers. Colton, do you have any suggestions for these major companies in order to get credible journalism out there first so we're not just seeing opinion pieces that kind of even polarize us more to where we're only seeing stuff if I agree with the right or if I agree with the left? Well, there's, there's an issue with that in and of itself where the, um, as Daniel was saying, the company has its own interests in mind. It needs to make a profit. It needs to do certain things. And at a certain point, I'm not sure where that is in their organizational structure, somebody makes a decision as to whether or not they are going to be politically correct or if they're going to be profitable. Um, if that's what their focus is going to be on, uh, providing information or in Google's sense, they have the, uh, they have the ownership over YouTube, which is primarily for entertainment and uh, whether that's the route that they want to go down because if you have these different outlets that don't have any emphasis on strict information or uh, 
any guidelines as to what information has to be absolutely correct before you can put it on there, it's very difficult to ensure that those can be in there because if you don't have it entirely devoted to this is a news source, everything that you say has to be correct, you can't have half the videos that they have on YouTube. You can't have half the websites that exist because of how many of them are trying to be entertaining or satirical. I want to hit on a point as my last question um, that Donald talked about um, social media and blogs and people becoming really their own their own journalists without being signed to a network. Um, do you think social media can be a good tool for journalism and journalistic ethics or is it kind of hurting us? I personally think that it is. it has the potential to be a great uh, source because it allows people with, who have just a notebook and a camera to get out there and investigate things, but then you also have every person with a notebook and a camera going out there and investigating things and putting their own spin on things and doing things the way that they want to. And you run into the issue where there might be one good nugget here, but it's surrounded by just piles and piles of garbage. Um, and so, it, especially when it's something that more people are going to just throw away on Facebook and uh, YouTube and on, if anybody actually uses Google+, Plus, uh, everything that people put out there, uh, it's going to be a sea of horribleness and it, so it makes it to the point where everything gets buried, including the stuff that is good or helpful. Well, that is our time for a break. I want to thank our two panelists, Colton Scholl and Donald Wilkinson, for joining us. Next, we'll discuss the rise of political activism coming up shortly. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm with sophomore journalism student Danielle Basilio and junior journalism student Kevin Crawl. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for having us. Uh, Danielle, I'm going to start with you. So one of the things that we've talked about um, on the last episode of The Scramble was the Parkland shooting. Um, the students of the Parkland shooting are very socially active. They are very um, politically active, I should say, on social media. Um, and then we saw the walkout happen on March 14th. School districts had a lot of mixed responses, as I've talked about. Um, should school districts be accepting of these political movements? You know, I do think um, schools should support political activism as long as it's fair and safe, um, especially when it comes to the safety of everything because schools do have, certain, have a certain liability to make sure that the students are overall, overall safe, if that makes sense. And Kevin, I'm gonna to toss the question to you. Should school districts be accepting of this? Um, I, I think absolutely, um, in the sense that when you look at what happened with the Parkland shooting, this became an issue um, less about just generic political activism, and it became more something about um, the lives that were lost. There's, you know, um, Danielle brought up a very good safety point that, you know, the, that the schools have as an obligation to those students, but this is more an issue of a point in time when, like, security just failed completely to like the worst degree it possibly could have and people are worried about that and they want to express that they're worried about that um, but on the other hand I, I would say that if anything the schools also have like a very narrow viewpoint on trying to just keep their students inside safe and educated and if you see like a walkout as running contrary to that I can sort of understand wanting to discourage that but not to the like this is something that is magnitudes above that, I would say. Danielle, I'm going to go uh, back to you. You mentioned that you, you think that they should be allowed, these movements should be allowed if it is safe and if it's fair. Going on fairness, if it was a walkout for something for people who were pro-guns, should schools have acted the same way? Or do you think we would have seen schools maybe more against it? You know, I still think even though it's a pro-gun argument, it still is a valid opinion to have. So I think you need to treat it the exact same way as you would have treated these walkouts for the enough is enough movement. Um, I think schools should step in in a point if there is a credible report of violence being incited. And I think that's where the line is drawn. And Kevin, do you think if this was a pro-gun movement or something that is against the typical norm of what we see with younger generations, their opinions, do you think we would have seen a different response from school districts? Um, I, I would hope not. I definitely, because in this sense, I would say that it's more just if you want to have um, 
people give their opinion, it's very important that especially students have the opportunity to see um, you know, multiple sides to a single issue. And even if they don't necessarily agree with a protest, being able to experience that and know what the other side is about can be very valuable to them. And as long as, you know, like Danielle said, they're not causing harm to themselves or to others, I, I don't really see that big of an issue with it. No, not at all. And regardless of what side this movement was on, um, with the, the walkout that we did have on March 14th, though, um, it was for, obviously, to represent the students that were killed. Um, we had some school districts saying that they would expel students, expel teachers, um, even though it was something that I personally don't think was against like safety. They were just walking out of the school, you know, for 17 minutes, missing class time, and then coming back in. Um, was that an appropriate response? Should expelling students be an acceptable response to political activism? I think expelling students is a little bit harsh, but I also do think that schools, again, do have that liability to make sure all students are accounted for and overall safe, again, like I said. So I do think schools have the right to discipline their students if they decide to take advantage of that protest and just to simply miss out on class rather than actually participate in the protest. But what schools have to understand as well is that they do not have the right to interfere with a student's decision not to participate simply based on the content of what the protest is about. Kevin, the same question that I asked Danielle. Um, expelling students, is that appropriate? No, not, not really, because this is like, the only way I could really see it as something that's defendable is again, if you prioritize getting people to graduation and getting them like their diploma or whatever above all else, and if you see people deliberately missing class time for like non-health related reasons, you could argue as to whether or not gun safety is a health issue. But like if that's your whole basis, that's the only way I could really see it. As it stands, it seems like students are showing that they're very concerned about their well-being, the well-being of their peers, um, faculty and staff members in their own environment where they spend most of, of their like day. And the response to that is not to be we're going to hear you and we're going to help you but instead it's if you do this we're going to remove you from our institution and i don't think that's the right way to go at all um i know both of you guys have both mentioned um safety and the fact that this walkout could have been you know a liability to the school um, but what about when it is with the country we saw um over the past week we had three far-right activists um they tried to enter the uk one of them being lauren southern um, and they were denied entry with the uk saying that basically that their uh political activism could be a threat to society can political activism even be a threat well, I think it depends on how far political activism goes and what your definition of political activism is, is as well. Um, political activism can go as far as just creating a dialogue between someone, whether it critiques your point of view, or it can even go as far, and I wouldn't even consider it polit political activism at the point where there is the incitement of fighting words or the incitement of violence that comes from it. And I think when it comes to the three journalists that were not allowed into the UK, I think the UK focused more on the violence that can arise from the views that these three journalists had. And how do you feel about this? I would say that the the decision to like sort of bar them from entry, it's 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 a very loaded thing to say that they could have caused violence. You could say that, you know, by people being there, you could have a potentiality for a riot to occur and they could have wanted to like avoid that. But I think that if that was their aim and that was what they were worried about, then they should have said something. They should have made that aspect to it clear because that is something that could definitely happen. But on its own, uh, no, it sort of goes back to um, the point about allowing you know, both sides to have a protest if they want to. You're only really not letting people voice their opinion to people who might actually gain something from hearing another perspective. Shouldn't, um, if it insinuates violence, their, that their uh, political activism insinuates violence from other people who either agree or disagree, uh, shouldn't that be on the people of their country or should that be on them? Does the UK have a responsibility to be like, we can prevent this by denying access? You actually, that's a very good point. Yes, it is definitely on the people of the environment where these like 
foreign entities are coming into. Because if if you suggest that you know people in um, the United Kingdom are so like prone to aggression in response to um, even the mentioned, like not even in dialogue, just we're going to have three right wing leaning people coming into our country, and you're worried that your people are going to start throwing you know like rocks or whatever. That says a lot more about. The, the way that you view your own people as opposed to how you view um, people who come into your country, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you also agreed with Kevin on um, the fact that the UK, you know, they do have a right to do that, but is it more like the same question I asked him, is it more on the the people of the UK or is it on the people who are can possibly insinuate this? You know, I do have to agree with Kevin that it is somewhat on the people of the UK. I think part of being part of a democratic society and being part of poli political activism is also to be politically informed. And kind of just holding those three journalists back saying you're not allowed to go in, whether it was based off violence or we just don't like your opinion, I think that is actually a detriment and it's a step back from trying to be politically informed for the general public. And what about celebrities or athletes? Can or do they have a right? Do they have a place where they can be socially active? Or is that going to look bad on the teams or whatever company they represent? Right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, whether they are a celebrity, an athlete, they are still part of the American democracy. They are still taxpayers and they have their right to their own opinion. I think that celebrities and athletes should be aware of how influential and powerful their platform actually is though. Um, making sure, again, not just to spread fake news like we talked in the other segment, but to also be politically informed and aware and making sure that they understand both sides of the political spectrum. And Kevin, do you think that celebrities, I mean, we had the example of Le LeBron James. He was told to shut up and dribble by a Fox reporter. Is that appropriate? Should he have been able to, is there time and place for political activism? I think there certainly is, but I think there's more opportunities for that than the Fox News reporter may necessarily think. I think Danielle made a very good point, although I, I would make the same from a different angle, I guess. Not only is someone like LeBron James a taxpayer, he's also just a person who has to exist in the society. He has to go to, although maybe not as often, he has to go to the same shopping centers as regular people. He has to go to the same just locations in general. He has to abide generally by the same rules as everybody else. And it only makes sense that as a member of this society, no matter what his station may be, he should be able to, or anybody in that station, should be able to voice whatever opinions or concerns he or she may have. And very quickly, I want to ask both of you guys, um, in one sentence or less, <laughs> just because of our time, um, we're all journalism majors here, um, but does these issues that are prevalent right now under in this political climate, does it make you want to be more politically active? More than politically active, I think it wants me to be more poli politically informed, making sure that I do know both sides of the spectrum, like I said before. To, um, of, to make sure we're reporting fair, fairly and accurately. And Kevin, very quickly. I would say not really, but it makes me more interested in it. All right. I want to thank our panelists once again. Thank you to Danielle Basilio and Kevin Kral, and thank you to the viewers. If you want to stay up to date with us, you can follow us at UNLV The Scramble on Facebook and Twitter. As always, my name's Sarah Coker. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.